Hey now, welcome to another edition of the Inside BS Show. My name is Dave Lorenzo, and who can you trust with your money? And how do you make the decision who you can trust with your money? Well, to answer that question today, we have my friend Patrick Cote. He's going to share with us how to select the right person to prepare for your financial future. And he's even going to give us a few pointers on what to look for when you're thinking about your long-term future, your short-term future, and what you should be doing with your portfolio on a regular basis in order to make sure you're doing everything the right way. Please join me in welcoming Patrick Cote to the Inside BS Show. Patrick, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Thanks for having me, Dave. Glad to to be here. All right. So, Patrick, how did you get started in the world of helping people plan their financial future? Uh, Did this just come to you one day? Were you like a little baby financial advisor (laughs) running around the house telling your parents what to do with their money? How did you get started in this? Well, actually, part of the motivation goes way back uh, to when I was about 20 years old. I've always been interested in the investment world. And I saw several family members close to me who were living paycheck to paycheck, even though they were high earners. And you know, I realized at the time that there were some things that they could do that would actually really help their situation. But being a cocky 20-year-old, uh, my advice didn't go over very well. <laughs> and so they didn't, they didn't really change their habits. And so years as the years went by, I saw they had not really saved up and invested along the way, and it really did hurt them. And so later on, as I uh, was working in the investment world, uh, I, I thought that this would be a good way to do good and also continue to work in the investments and in, in area of passion for myself. So, you know, it's it's interesting that you mentioned that. I know a lot of people who do very well. I mean, on an annual basis, they take home a, a good amount of money that would probably put them in the top, say, 10% or maybe even in the top 5% of wage earners in the country, but they're not ready for retirement. They're not planning on their retirement because they're chasing yesterday's bills with tomorrow's money. So what's the best advice you can give to those people right now, aside from, you know, hey, stop doing that. Well, what do you, what, what do we need to do to stop doing that? There's really a few things that make a big difference. So do the easy stuff. You don't have to dramatically change your life, but especially if they are a high earner, it's not a big deal for them to make sure they're doing the basics, you know, make sure that they're, you know, maximizing their 401k, especially if they get a, uh, a some kind of match from their employer that's free money that they're leaving on the table if they don't if they don't take it. And then, but also the other thing where I do see people run into issues is making sure they've got some extra outside of the 401k. And these are even amongst the high earners. We, we sometimes come across people who are in a situation where they might have a lot of money, so they, you know, a million dollars in a 401k or multiple 401ks, but nothing else. And so... There's no buffer there if anything bad happens. So helping them kind of build up that emergency fund. And you know, the exact amount can vary, but just frankly going from nothing and sometimes having outstanding credit card bills uh, to all of a sudden having some saved up and a cushion is life-changing for them. Even if even if they don't necessarily build up a huge amount of overall assets from that, just taking that short-term pressure off really helps. It's time once again for another Sandrowski Business Minute, and we're here with Jody Mersinger, and she's going to help us with this question. Jody, everybody asks me about succession planning and their business. What happens if the owner retires? What happens if the owner dies? What are we talking about when we're talking about succession planning, and what should people be thinking about? Right. So when planning for the succession of management, generally it's advisable to have some kind of plan in place to incentivize your key employees. This may include um, phantom stock plans, phantom, this may include phantom stock plans, for instance. Um, Also, we advise when you are doing succession planning and management is that each head of the department should have a written plan of what they do on a day-to-day basis and what should be done in the event of um, an untimely departure of that head of the department. Um, also, key man insurance is, is helpful in the event that an untimely, in the, also key man insurance should be evaluated in the event of an untimely departure of a key person to replace any disruption in revenue. Uh, with respect to the succession planning of the ownership of the company. 
we advise to have a buy-sell agreement or some buy-sell provisions in you know, your operating agreement, for instance. Uh, this, first of all, allows you to contemplate what you want to have happen in certain events. There are trigger events that you can contemplate such as death or disability or retirement and what you want to happen with regard to your shares, whether it's redeemed from the company or a, a third party is allowed to purchase it or whether another shareholder will purchase it. And these provisions can also include financing provisions. Um, you can also evaluate insurance to assist in the buyout with regard to the shares. Um, but succession planning ahead of time is important. Um, also, you know, an owner besides having some of these documents in place, you know, five to ten years out from when they may want to retire should, you know, we'll be looking at their options, whether it's going to be sale of a company, whether it's going to be use of an ESOP, getting the employees involved, or whether they'll be hiring from the outside with regard to the management or from the inside. Um, and also there's always, you know, family options that may be considered if it's a family business and gifting and so forth. But in, in all cases, the, we advise a company to have a board of directors that will assist in decision making so that if something does happen to a key person or the main owner, that there is a board that is assisting with the decision making. All right. So if you have a business and you're worried about the future of your business, you need a succession plan. The person to call is Jody Mersinger. I want you to give her a call at 866-717-1607, 866-717-1607. Sandrowski Corporate Advisors, an accounting firm with a different perspective. So you mentioned something there that I that I find is uh, is really interesting and that I think could really benefit a lot of people who are listening or who are watching now. Let's say we started late, right? Yeah. So I'm 53 and let's say I started from today and I'm, you know, I, I don't ever plan on retiring. I'm going to die at my desk because I love what I do, but I still should be sheltering that money from today's taxes and, you know, putting it away and maybe paying taxes down the road when, when I'm making less money, right? So if I start today and I got nothing, but I have, uh, but I just developed a great business and I'm making enough money where I can start putting some away, what's your advice for people who start late? Well, I, I, before I do that, just coincidentally, I'm 53 as well. And I also will die at my desk because I love what I do. So, but uh, yeah, to answer your question. So yeah, so there's some, some key things people need to do. I mean, first off, make sure we're not doing any of the bad stuff, you know? Don't have credit card bills outstanding. That's one of the killers, especially as we get into a higher interest rate world. You really don't want to have that because that causes a huge amount of damage. So build up the emergency fund, build up longer term savings. You know, as I mentioned before, the 401k, make sure that gets going. You know, depending how much they make, if they can do a Roth IRA, I love those. But, you know, if, if you're a, a higher income earner, you, you, you won't qualify to be able to put money in there. But you can actually do a Roth 401k with a lot of employer plans now. So basically get going with the savings there. And and the trick for that, rather than trying to solve everything day one, is to do it incrementally. Get going, you know, like with a paycheck, I think most people are familiar with the idea of a little bit taken off each paycheck for the 401k. So you do dollar cost averaging with that. And so like you're gradually getting into the market, you know, it, because it's not a huge amount you're doing at once, it's less painful. And you basically do the same thing on a broker, in a brokerage account as well. And so that's taxable. Just gets going. It can help with with saving some money, and make sure. And uh, you know, I think the exact way to do that emergency fund can vary for uh, each person, but some form of bank account where you're just building up a little bit extra too, so that you've got that cushion. So if, you know, I think the every year the uh, Federal Reserve does a study, and literally about half the country would not be able to cover a four hundred dollar unexpected expense that popped up, and that's that's very stressful for obviously for the people who are in that situation. And for most people, it's it's avoidable, you know, just by starting to build up a small amount of money along the way can really make a big difference. So, Pat, what do we do? So the difference between a wage earner who gets a steady paycheck every couple of weeks and uh, an entrepreneur or a business owner who's kind of got peaks and valleys, is your is your advice to them any different? So if there's a so a wage earner every couple of weeks, well, you know, there's another paycheck coming in 14 days. 
So, you know, if I've got, uh, you know, my car needs a new tire, I take the bus for seven days or five days and then, you know, and then I can, I can go get the tire when I get paid again. But like an entrepreneur with peaks and valleys, what do you, what, what should they be doing differently? Should they be taking a huge portion of their distributions and putting it into a retirement vehicle or take specific timely distributions? Is there any strategic difference between being an entrepreneur and being a wage earner? Yes, there are some differences. So, I mean, there are some tax advantages that the uh, the entrepreneurs have because they can set up their own retirement plans and often legitimately put some expenses in uh, for their business, which is a huge help because that helps lower the taxes. But with respect to savings, so the big difference is if you have a regular paycheck that someone else is giving you, you can just save regularly. You don't need to worry about it at that point. Other than having some kind of emergency fund that's really specific to your situation, and the rule of thumb is anywhere from three to 12 months worth of, of your expenses, your overall household expenses in cash or near cash investment. So very secure. So if, you know, if you're talking about uh, a, a married couple and they're both uh, income earners, both in very secure jobs, they might only need three months worth of expenses in cash just because they're, you're talking a pretty like l- low risk scenario. If you're talking another scenario, you know, I say call it a married uh, a couple with a couple of young kids, one primary breadwinner who's an entrepreneur in a relatively new company. That's a pretty high risk scenario. And so, and I do have some, actually some clients like that. And so I will suggest that they have a lot more saved up in their emergency fund, you know, 12 months or more in, in there, just in case things go wrong, because you never know when, when bad things happen. And in that scenario, especially because the cash flows coming to the entrepreneur are going to be dependent on the business, that's where the the savings tend to line up, right? So take the cash flows as they come from the business rather than trying to impose, you know, your own personal preferences necessarily on them. And that you kind of have to do when you're the business owner. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about retirement and how should we view retirement, right? So everybody thinks about their present day lifestyle. And they think to themselves, man, my, how am I going to ever afford this when I'm 75, right? But the truth of the matter is our lifestyles change dramatically. So when you sit down with a client, what do you, how do you prepare them for what their lifestyle is going to look like 15, 20, 30 years into the future? Oh, it's a great question. And, and the reality is just the, the way everyone thinks about retirement is changing pretty dramatically. Uh, so I just had, I literally this afternoon, just had a conversation with a client who's 70 years old and she just retired. And so she is actually, she, uh, she's gone back to her former employer because they asked her to help out doing 10 hours a week. And I said, so what do you think? Well, I'm like, how does all this work out? And she said, you know what? It's worked out really, really well. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of research that shows that uh, it's beneficial for people, both obviously financially, but even physically and mentally to keep working. And, but the trick is, of course, not doing something that you don't like if you don't have to and trying to ma- manage that. So what I think where I think a lot of folks would like to end up is doing some kind of work that they continue to, to enjoy, but in a part-time basis. So something to stay engaged, keep their mind sharp, uh, and to obviously still engage socially with people. And, you know, that's all changed, obviously, with, with COVID now, too. So that can mean different things. It doesn't necessarily mean going into an office physically. It could still mean, you know, uh, Zoom calls, uh, but at least still interacting with folks and keeping the mind going is really, really helpful. And what's the what's the number one kind of uh, misconception that your clients come to you with when they start when they ha- first have a conversation with you about retirement? Well, I think for a lot of them, and this tends to be for folks who are really feeling the pressure from their jobs. Like they might be in, you know, maybe we deal with Henry's and a higher earner is not rich yet, and so many of them have, you know, they're very successful but they're in professions that are extremely high pressure and, you know, they just feel that, you know, they'd like to stop. And so one of the things I I try to encourage them to do is think about not necessarily stopping all forms of work, but just thinking about transitioning, you know, like, uh, especially if, if they're, if they've been in those kinds of uh, careers where a lot of their self identity is tied up in what they do, it's a huge break to all of a sudden just become retired. And for some people, some people are happy golfing 100% of the time, you know, with their in their retirement. But many folks are not. And so just thinking through like what that transition would look like, you know, and start preparing for laying the groundwork if they can, starting to join some boards, starting to get involved with some things where 
they can still do something part time afterwards, but maybe not in that high pressure situation. And, and frankly, they actually, what's what's the other positive with that is that actually lets them retire a little bit earlier. So if it's not this kind of black or white, well, okay, I'm going to work till I'm 65 and then I'm going to stop and do nothing. You know, all of a sudden, if you want to uh, stop a little bit earlier from the high pressure job, but go to something that's lower pressure, lower pay, but something you still enjoy, but that you figure you could do for, you know, 10, 20 years, like that's, that's a lot, that's a lot more attractive in many ways. And it means people can move to that a lot earlier too, just because it supports the numbers better. Yeah. You mentioned earlier uh, when we first started talking about credit card debt, and I want to um, I want to really emphasize this because I run into a lot of people, my clients, who uh, talk about, oh, you got to use leverage in order to be successful. And, you know, the people who taught us in business school about using leverage to be successful were talking about low interest rates, low, low interest rate loans to buy a productive asset that was going to allow you to pay back the loan before perhaps the maturity date so you wouldn't have to get killed with all that interest. Nobody was talking about credit cards. So explain to folks so that I'm not the only one <laughs> saying this, how damaging credit cards can be if you're not charging something and then paying it right off. Well, that's absolutely true. And, and it's on from two fronts, really, because the loans, uh, like the, the the leverage you're talking about is good leverage, you know? So in general, student loans, you know, they, they can go wrong if things are not done correctly, but the in general, that's a good thing to have because you're investing in yourself, you know, or the, the person's investing in, or maybe you're investing in your kids and helping them in something ver- become more productive in the future and will probably make a lot more money because of that too. So financially it pays off. So that's a, that's a good investment there and it requires some leverage, some borrowing to get there. Uh, same with the house as well. Like that's also quite a good thing where you know, you're investing in something that's going to give you a high value uh, and hopefully uh, some potential uh, positive financial returns out of that as well. So those are all positive examples of it and both are generally not too expensive. Well, student loans can be a lot pricier now than you know, there's a lot that is still floating around like eight, 9% and they're starting to tick up again as interest rates go up. But in general, they're not, uh, they're, they're, they're not, they're certainly not in the 20% range. So credit cards are often used for things that are not necessarily an investment in yourself. You know, it might be for something that might be fun, but it might be for some thing that you've bought for yourself or some service or, you know, which again, all things that are consumed and not necessarily that investment in your future. And which is perfectly fine. You know, we all want to do those things, but it's, it's when you can't afford it, when you don't have the cash to pay it back. So you're doing this immediate consumption and then having to pay it in the future. And they're at much higher rates. And those are getting worse now as interest rates go up. So now you're talking the 20% rates. So all of a sudden that $100 meal becomes, you know, a $300 meal over the years as you, as you take a while to pay that back. So, uh, so it's just the, the uh, higher rates and not necessarily being as productive with the investment. So tell us a little bit about asset grade. Um, what what brought you to form or found asset grade? How did you how did you decide that you wanted to go out and start your own shop? Sure. So I, you know I mentioned like seeing the like I kind of had that in the back of my mind. You know, seeing those family members who would benefit from that. Uh, back in 2013, I was at Fidelity, and the department I was in uh, shut down, and so at the time they offered. Uh, they offered packages or they said, or you could uh, find something else within the company. So it was at the time I was thinking, well, you know, I've really wanted to do this. And it was, everything was kind of coming together that really, it was like a really interesting time to start up an advisor firm. It was, the the uh, investment advisor space has evolved a lot over the years. And so there was no one really uh, focusing in between the way we, we kind of set our, set our, ourselves up. And so uh, we set up as a fee-only registered investment firm, our fee-only RAA. And a lot of them at the time certainly were focused on the much higher net worth uh, individuals and families. And so we saw an opportunity to set up a firm like that that, that, that was targeting the Henrys, the high earners, not rich yet. And so folks who might not necessarily have five or 10 million plus in an asset, uh, but also like... Uh, do it in a way that's really set up well for them, leveraging the technology that was starting to emerge too. So from day one, we set ourselves up to be a virtual firm. So we didn't go in with all of the kind of the legacy back offices and systems and all that that a lot of firms had. And it's kind of a nightmare to switch away from those legacy systems. So we started with a clean slate 
the whole uh, the whole way the technology was working for the advisor space was changing too. So we were able to leverage a lot of that stuff. So we were able to do all of that, keep our costs really low, but set up really high quality level of service uh, to to uh, to clients at that point. And we were, uh, you know, because of uh, you know, and I started this with uh, with Chris Sullivan back in 2013, who was the the head of the bond group at Fidelity, and so he had just retired and was happy to help out. And so um, Fidelity was was nice to us. We knew them, and so they took us on. Like we use them, we use Fidelity as our as our custodian, and so which means that all our clients' money is held at Fidelity. And so they, they never take on startup advisor shops, but they they made the exception for us because the, because we, we we knew them and they had confidence in us and and the business plan. And so we were able to take off from there. And then uh, fortunately, we uh, two very strong partners came on board. Uh, people I knew at uh, Fidelity in the past, so Susan Powers and Kate Hennessy, uh, and they've helped help grow the team. And we've also grown our board of advisors accordingly too. So uh, we've been very fortunate with a very strong team that we built since then. And you guys are growing like crazy. You're one of the top advisor firms by growth in the country. What has been responsible for that? How have you, and how can people replicate what you've done? Oh, sure. Well, thanks. Uh, so yeah, we were Fortunately, we found out we were number 31 out of the 14,800 advisor wow, firms. Wow, that's tremendous. Yes, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it's a few things. So, uh, you know, we're all, my partners and I are all very active in uh, in getting uh, and meeting people, getting to uh, network is through groups like Provisors, where you and I met, uh, as well as other kinds of groups. Uh, we've also all been on Sirius XM Radio. So one of the Wharton professors hosts a show on Wharton Business Radio, Channel 132, uh, called uh, Your Money. So it's uh, Ken Spiders who hosts it every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. And so uh, we've all been guest advisors on his show. And uh, that's been a, a great source of business for us because it's a good way for people to get to know us. As, you know, it's pre-COVID, it was all live. And uh, so now we've been recording over for the last couple of years, but it's really a chance, you know, because we're on there for a while, it's a chance for people to get to know us and hear about our approach. And so we've had a lot of people reach out to us over the years with that. Well, and what better place for a financial advisor to be than on a channel named Your Money? I yep. mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's, that's where right. you want to be. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so so that's, that's outstanding. Um, who is your ideal client? I mean, obviously you said Henry's, right? High earner, not rich yet. Yep. So how do I find them? I'm walking down the street. How do I find <laughs> those people? Like, how do we how do we come across them? Sure. So they're typically uh, mid-career professionals. Uh, we have a lot of physicians as clients, uh, t- uh, physicians and, and also a lot of business owners. So it's typically, you know, our, our age ranges quite a bit. I mentioned the seven-year-old client today. Typically, they're mostly in their 50s, you know, 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, I'd say for the most part. And and the biggest thing is that most of them are still working. And so we're helping them get there. And so a lot of them, they might, as I said, they might already have uh, significant assets built up. But for, uh, you know, they want to be tax efficient with it, especially if they are high earners. Taxes are a huge part of life. And so um, so we work like with uh, with folks, especially if they've got their own business, to set up uh, retirement plans that are a little bit, um, uh, 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 they're very specialized. So not only the 401ks, but these cash balance and defined benefit plans, it's a terrific way for these higher earners who have their own business to save additional money every year. So not only for the, the amount they can put in the 401k, they can put an extra 200000 a year typically in these retirement plans. So that they're very, very popular with folks who are able to do that, who have got the assets and the income to support that. So, um, so those end up being our ideal client. Well, that's great. What is a what is a closing conversation like for you? Are you are you generally you're? I would imagine you're not the first financial advisor most people hire, right? So somebody's got to switch yeah. from somebody else they're working with. Obviously, if they're not happy with that person, it's an easier conversation for you. But what is that conversation like when they finally make the decision? Have you met with them a couple of times? What's the sales cycle like? Sure. Talk us through it. Sure. Well, at this point, uh, what we what we typically find is we'll we'll set up an initial uh, discussion, and I would say for the vast majority of folks, it just takes one conversation, uh, and we'll go through. We don't charge for it. We'll go through the conversation, talk about their financial situation.
And explain to, to the folks who are listening and watching and to me the difference between being a, a fee-only financial advisor versus somebody who makes commission by selling a product or a service and explain how people can tell the difference. Well, and it's a great question. And this is actually something that the Wharton professor talks about on that show. Like he will only invite the fee-only advisors. In fact, his mantra on the show is only fee-only. And the industry, unfortunately, makes it very confusing for people to un- like to understand what the differences are and kind of clouds it all. Everybody calls themselves a financial advisor no matter what they're doing. And so the only uh, ones out there who are fiduciaries, in other words, legally required to act in their client's best interest 100% of the time, it are the fee-only registered investment advisors, fee-only RIAs. Um, there are other folks who can do that some of the time and... Uh, What's, what's confusing is that um, they tend to be less well-known firms. So most of the fee-only RIA firms are not household names. So my firm, Asset Grade, we're getting there, but we're not yet a household name. And uh, most of the uh, large firms that everybody knows are brokerage firms. And so uh, so they uh, like will have different models of compensation for the advisors, but they'll often have uh, commissions for products. And so it doesn't mean that the uh, that the advisors who work there are bad people by any stretch, but it can lead to a conflict of interest if they're paid, you know, something from company A versus something else from company B. They may, you know, they, they may be facing a conflict of interest with the with their client. The other thing that can be quite confusing is there's another term that's used out there called fee based, and so fee based is not the same thing. In fact, fee based often means that they're double dipping. They can charge a fee from the client, but they're also receiving commissions from uh, the, the fund management firms. So, uh, so just something for people to be aware of. So, is there a disclosure requirement, or do we just need to ask? Like, the, do people have to tell you if they're getting a commission? It's it's murky, and so a lot of the commissions are kind of hidden. And in fact, I will sometimes uh, people will like you know new clients or prospects might hand me the statements and say, "Can you tell me what I'm paying?" And I'll search through these like 50 pages of documents and I can't find it, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm in the industry, I can't find this. So it's, you know, for somebody who doesn't do this for a living, it's very difficult for them to find. So frankly, um, one, one thing I've suggested when people have asked something like that, one thing I, I've suggested is request it in writing from their advisor today to, to find out what have you charged me and my family for all of my accounts and all forms over the, over the last year and request the response in writing. It's very unambiguous, whatever the form of compensation, whether it's called a fee, a commission, or whatever it's called, uh, it, it will show up in there. And uh, I've had people come back to me afterwards because they, they, they asked me the same question. And so when they got that answer from their advi- <laughs> former advisors, they were not happy to find out the reality. Uh, so Because sometimes the commissions can be quite high. And unfortunately, it's very hard to find that. Yeah, so... Who is from a from an asset uh, standpoint? Who is the the type of person that you want to work with? Because you're only going to make money based on the assets that they're that they're investing, right? It's got to be worth your while to do it. So, is there a threshold that you have as far as clients go? That's right. We do have a minimum. Uh, our minimum now is five hundred thousand in investable assets, and that's across all their accounts, including their four hundred one k. And that's based on the fee that we'll charge because we charge a minimum fee of uh, $5,000 per year. So, you know, our fee for the first 2 million in assets is 1%, 1% of assets. So, so we can take on clients with less than 500,000 and especially if maybe if they have 400,000 and they're higher earners and they're saving quite a bit, it's worth it. And I'm very open with the clients too and and just say, it's not really worth it for you. You I've had some clients who've come in with a couple hundred thousand and they try to give them pointers and just say, look, it's really not worth it for you at this point. You know, I'm happy to wait a little while if you are able to come back with more down the road or there might be some other uh like, you know going to some of the retail shops like at fidelity just like the basic investor center just to get some basic advice there uh which is not bad advice you know at the, and especially because that way it will be free but they get something to get them going um but you know for for us it is uh five hundred thousand, and then we have uh cl- clients with significantly more assets than that and we we charge less as we get to higher uh, asset levels to like the, the percentages drop. Now, what if somebody has been like a real estate person for their whole career, uh-huh. right? They never, they never invested in the stock market. They didn't have a 401k. They have some income producing properties and they're, you know, they're winding down in their career and they, they want a little bit more stability. And then they come to you. 
How do you, do you take a holistic look at their portfolio and say, listen, I don't handle real estate purchases and sales, but here's something I think you might want to do with these three assets, keep these three. Do you look at their entire investment portfolio, not just stocks and bonds and, you know, securities? But we do. We definitely do. And so that happens uh, quite a bit for, for, uh, for our clients. In fact, we have some almost exactly like you described. And so we actually have different flavors of our portfolios that we'll recommend to clients. And we have some that have all of the real estate holdings stripped out just because real estate as an asset class has been a terrific one. You know, it's going to be actually one of the top performing asset classes over the last couple of decades. Um, however, if you're already, if your income is tied to it and you have other assets tied to it, you don't want to be doubling down and having yet more assets uh, in your investment portfolio uh, tied to real estate. So we will do a portfolio that does not include any real estate investments in there. So on the other side of the coin now, let's talk about the person who say works for IBM and they have their 401k with IBM and their 401k is all invested in IBM stock, right? You don't want to, you don't want to do that either. So explain to people why that's like, I call that like the Enron paradigm, right? Uh-huh. Everybody who had their 401k with Enron and had their, had their 401k invested in Enron stock because it was going up like a rocket until it wasn't. So explain to people why that's not a good idea either, the other side. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So uh, you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket. And so having it all in Enron or IBM shares, and I always tell them, look, the the company might be the best company in the world. And you can think of some companies where people have made enormous amounts of money, you know, Apple or some of these other companies where the the employees just left it all on company stock. They did extraordinarily well. The the challenge is that uh, that's a huge, huge bet. And especially as that's built up over the years, you don't want to continue to do that. So we always encourage folks to to, to reduce it. And you know, if they want to keep this relatively small percentage, that's that's fine. But you, you really don't want to have a significant part of your portfolio tied to the same company that pays your pay that uh, gives you your paycheck. Yeah. As somebody who helps people manage their assets, manage their financial well being, what have you learned over the last couple of years of COVID? What, what really surprised you and what what did you do with your money or what what's the best advice you gave to you, like your best friend with his or her money yeah. uh, as a result of COVID? Well, the best thing as we've seen is just is not to not to make dramatic changes to your portfolio. You know, so if, thinking back to the early declines, you know, so the spring of 2020, the market fell like 35 percent in two, three months. And it really wasn't clear what was going to happen at that point. And you know, we, we had some calls and, you know, most of our clients, as I mentioned, they're still saving and investing along the way. So, so a number of them are good with continued to invest. And in fact, some are saying, should we put more in? And so as long as they could handle that from their personal situation, we encourage that. Uh, but we also had some who were very concerned and wanted to sell out, even if it was at a big loss at that point. And so the biggest thing was encouraging them to take a long-term view. Again, if you kind of split out, like, and we always encourage folks to have the barbell approach, right? That emergency fund on one side, long-term portfolio on another. As long as you're, you're good in the short term with the emergency fund, keep the long-term view. And frankly, you know that, you know, the markets go up and now we're seeing it again this year, but just, you know, don't overreact to it. Just keep the long-term view going with it. And that, that's the biggest thing to help people out. Do you, do you ever, do you ever have to deal with people who, look at the S&P 500 over like 20 years and they say, hey, Pat, I looked at the S&P over the last 20 years and, you know, my portfolio has barely outpaced the gains of the S&P. What what is your answer? I mean, I hear that all the time, right? And to me, I I don't want to, I don't want to kind of give away the answer here, but to me, I just kind of shake my head. What's, what's your answer when somebody says, ah, Pat, if I had just put it in an S&P 500 fund, you know, I'd be making 12% over 25 years. You know how much that would be. What is your response to that? No, I don't think that's, that's fair. And I think, you know, the the right portfolio is different for everyone and in fact warren buffett had suggested that for some people and in certain situations that you know i think what gets lost in that example that's often cited for it is that you know the people for whom that's a good thing are in a really small pool because you know having everything in one asset class like that and having nothing else that's going to jump around a lot and there's a lot of volatility especially as we get older right so you know, most people don't want that much volatility. Like, look at just look at what's happened so far this year. You know, you can have pretty wild swings there. So people want to have a few other asset classes to help round out the portfolio. It tends to smooth the big bumps along the way with that. And and frankly, doing that and, and frankly, our investment approach too 
is we don't uh, claim to have any predictive abilities to either you know predict where the stock market is going or predict which stocks are going to outperform or finding the next Tesla stock or what what have you. It's, it's really you know actually performing around the index or performing around the S and P five hundred for that for those U.S. large caps. Look, that's a good thing. Most people do not get that, you know, despite what you might hear at cocktail parties, people are not getting that as their actual investment returns. Like the DIY investors, all the research shows they get way less than that because we're emotionally wired to do the wrong thing. You know, when, when the stock market goes up, everyone jumps in because they think it's a good thing to, you know, stocks are good. They've gone up, but unfortunately that's the worst time to buy because you're buying an eye. And then when the opposite happens, when they fall, they say, oh, stocks are bad. I'm selling, (laughs) then you're selling, selling low. You want to do the opposite, and we're not wired to do that emotionally. So it's very hard, and and we can see the research where people don't overall they don't they don't do that. They should look at their stock portfolio. People should look at their stock portfolio like they look at their the investment in their home, right? Yeah. You invest in your home, so you take out a thirty year mortgage most of the time, yeah. and you're taking out a thirty year mortgage because you're going to be in that house for thirty years, and you don't care what the value of that house is in year three. You don't even care what the value of the house is in year 12 or 15 because your kids aren't ready to move out yet. Then when your kids go to college, you look at the value of your house and you're like, listen, we could sell anytime in the next three to five years. And now we got to really concentrate on when we should pick the right time to sell. But you don't look at the value of your house in year three, yet you take your money and you invest it in equities and the next day you're freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. You know, I hadn't heard that that analogy before about thinking about it in the time frame of a house, but you're right. Turn off the TV. Yeah, you're right. Unplug it. Yeah. <laughs> no more CNBC <laughs> for you. You put your money in and you call me in 30 years. That's what you need to do. <laughs> and, and by the way, like the, the most entertaining guys on CNBC, like, and I won't mention any names, but the research has shown their performance is horrible. They lag way behind the S&P 500, but they're just entertaining to watch. <laughs> Yeah, I mean they're they're basically they're carnival barkers. That's why yeah. that's why they have a show on TV. Yeah. The guy who gets a steady six seven percent, he ain't getting a show. No. They're not giving him a show. Yeah. That's very true. <laughs> All right, Pat. So here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you a minute to think about. It. I want you to give folks uh, three things they should take away from our time together. I'll give you a minute to think about that. I want to remind people uh, we're speaking with Pat Cote today. And if you want to reach out to him, you can call him at 617-933-7257, 617-933-7257. You also heard earlier in the show, we took a pause and you heard a Sandrowski Business Minute. If you want to reach out to Sandrowski Corporate Advisors, they're a CPA firm with a different perspective. You can call them at 866 866- 717-1607-866-717-1607. And I need to remind you right now that we're brought to you by My Revenue Roadmap Guide. So you have a business, you're a professional service provider, you want to grow your professional service business. Here's an easy way to do it. You need a plan, right? And you want a plan that helps you develop relationships. You want a plan that helps you educate your audience so that they understand that you're an expert in your field. I'm not talking about bus bench advertising. I'm not talking about SEO. I'm not talking about online advertising. Maybe there's a place for that in your professional services firm. But for the most, uh, for most of you who are listening, who are watching, you need a relationship-based business development plan. I'm going to give you my template that I use with my clients, and I'm going to give it to you for free. All you need to do is go to revenueroadmapguide.com, revenueroadmapguide.com. Enter your contact info there you can download your free business development plan and there's an entire booklet that explains how you can customize it for your professional practice. It doesn't matter if you're an engineer, an architect, a consultant, a financial advisor, an attorney, a CPA, go to revenueroadmapguide.com, enter your contact info, you can download it. We talk about repeat revenue, recurring revenue, we talk about passive revenue, and we also talk about ad hoc revenue, and we explain what the mix should be, and we teach you how to develop a plan that will enable you to attract all four types of revenue, but you're gonna wanna focus on three of the four. Really important that you download this now, revenueroadmapguide.com, enter your contact info. It's my gift to you for listening and watching the show. All right, Pat, what are the three things our listeners, our viewers should take away from our time together today? Uh, Well, first thing is don't try to time the market. Uh, Invest in index products, so keep it really simple for investing. And number three, if you are a Henry, if you're a high earner, not rich yet, 
pay attention to taxes. There are a lot of things you should be doing that can make a big difference there. All right, so if you're a Henry and you want the specific advice that Pat uh, can give you, and you've heard what his philosophy is here today, he's a very rational, very level-headed guy, I want you to give him a call. Call 617-933-7257, 617-933-7257. Pat Cote, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks, David. It was great chatting with you. All righty, folks, that'll do it for this week's, for this week. Oh my gosh, that'll do it for today's episode. I'm coming back tomorrow. Don't forget, be back here again tomorrow. That'll do it for today's episode of the Inside BS Show. My name is Dave Lorenzo. As I said, we're here every day with a great interview for you. Until tomorrow, here's hoping you make a great living and live a great life.